All right, so it is one o'clock. Um, thank you everyone for joining us today. We've got a few more folks coming in. So wh while um, everyone else is joining us, I'll take the moment to introduce myself um, for the last time for our No Place Like Home Challenge Huddles. My name is Amber Evie, and I'm a grant specialist at Maddie's Fund. I'll be your host today, um, and hopefully some of you have seen me now and are familiar with me. And also joining us, as always, is Gina Nepp. Gina is from Michelson Found Animals, which is one of the founding partners of this challenge as well. So if you've been um, on the huddles with us, you know this is our last one. Um, but the good news is we can still continue this conversation in um, two really excellent places. One is the Maddie's Pet Forum. And I'm seeing in the channel that there are some folks who have already uh, joined the Maddie's Pet Forum, which is great. We also have our community conversations um, that happen on Monday mornings at 8 a.m. Uh, Pacific time. And Brittany, if you don't mind putting the link to the community conversations information in the chat so folks can see it, that would be great. Um, but we can talk more about that when, as we talk about how uh, folks are using the channel and um, what everyone's been working on. So Gina, hi, nice to see you. Welcome. How is it hi. in Idaho? Is it super snowy? No, not where I live. Uh -uh. Oh, good. We had, we had a little powder yesterday, but it goes as fast as it comes. So except for that week that Texas was in trouble, we got a lot of snow. Um, but nothing that's in, in, un, unmanageable. So I'm kind of jazzed that today, so rewind, there's a guy named Tom Kremer and he's a student with Minerva University. And some of you may have seen the work that he did with the Dallas data. Um, Tom just emailed me this morning because he keeps refining his project. And I will drop the link to his project in the chat uh, it does take a little while to load, so be patient. And also, the, it requires a password and a, and, a, and a username. It's just demo demo, and you can get in and dig around. But what's really exciting about what he did with the Dallas RTO data or RTH data is that he rejiggered it. Hold on, I have to read the notes because I haven't committed to memory, but I just got it today. So. Maybe Dallas has seen it, but nobody else has. So you guys get a, a first sneak peek at it. So he took all of the figures and he organized it around census tracts. So there's a whole new page. There's a tab for census for Dallas County. And it's a pretty dynamic figure that lets shelters plot metrics like stray, RTO, length of stay, according to census, which are things like poverty and unemployment. So it really will illuminate the trends uh, between socioeconomic status and strays and RTO rates and length of time in the shelter. So again, super fascinating. If you log in, it takes a minute to load. Um, Tom is more than happy to help any shelter that is interested in producing a, a similar uh, report for their own data. He doesn't charge. Um, this is part of his graduation project. And yeah, I'm trying to help him find a job. The kid is just brilliant. And right now he's in England. So if you email him, it may take him a sec to reply. Although I think he's a vampire and doesn't sleep. I'm going to grab his email. He's just sharp. We need to figure out how to get a hold of him. Let's see. How do I pull his email up? Here we go. And he's adorable too, by the way. I should, probably shouldn't say that, but I'm old enough that I can say that, I think. Adorable in a really nice way. And here's his email. And he did offer today if anybody's interested. And I'm telling you, if, if, and it's not that hard. Now, Dallas has Chameleon, but I think if you have one of the, you know, standard shelter softwares, they can still, you know, pull the data and create the report. But spend some time looking to, at it because it's super fascinating. And data has, or Dallas has so much data that I think it's significant enough to, to say that that is valid, or is that the right term, Amber, scientifically valid? So it's not like 19 dogs, it's more like 40,000 dogs. So again, the, the vast majority of the lost animals, or dogs especially, are being found within a thousand feet of their home, something that I think we've heard uttered, but now the, the science behind it is proving to be true. So I wanted to share that. Hopefully you're as excited as I am, but I you know I get excited about really crazy stuff. So, 
before we get nuts, does anybody have a brag? Have you implemented anything during this challenge where you went, holy cow, or another word, um, this really works? Any surprises? We're all friends here. We've been together a lot. Yeah, so we don't have a speaker today, so we're relying on you all to help us facilitate the conversation and be the speakers. And if you're feeling a little shy, you can definitely, or if you're having trouble with the audio, you can definitely put it in the chat too. But it's even better if we can hear from you. Well, I'm just, I'm hearing from so many shelters, like for example, Fresno Humane in California, their RTO rate was I think 6%, which is really low, no place to go but up. And they admitted they hadn't tried or done anything. And I talked to Terry last week and I think they're at 9% in a very short period of time. So that's, that's pretty amazing. And one of the things they did was really clean up their website so that it made it super easy for people to know what to do if they find or lose an animal and to connect with the shelter to post it. Um, I see Deanne wrote, we're scouring the lost pet pages in the area and have gotten three dogs home in less than 24 hours in the last two days. That's so cool. That's amazing. Yeah, and you know, it's not rocket science. It's just kind of like elbow grease. It takes a little uh, desire, kind of like being a criminal. You have to have three things, desire, opportunity, and ability. And that's how I kind of like to look at RTO. <laughs> Let's see. And um, Deanne, before we move on to the next uh, piece of good news, I was just wondering when you say we, is that your staff? Is it volunteers? Is it, are you also being a vampire like Tom and staying up all night? How are you getting all those eyes on those pages? And it, I don't know uh, if she's gonna oh, Deanne and two other people, so. Again, not, not a ton of people, but still getting the work done, right? That's amazing. Yeah. So Lori shared that they created a new online lost and found form um, that people can fill out on the website. And yeah, while it's not new, it's new to you. It launches on Monday, but that's a big step towards helping people, you know, not only get reunited, but when our face or our, our websites, those of us that are in government, especially, our websites usually have a lot of traffic compared to other city or county websites. So we're sending us kind of a subliminal message to people about how we care about them and their animals. So it's, it's kind of marketing without intentionally marketing. That's all really good news. And Jennifer shared that you're about to open a Trello board that volunteers can use to communicate and match missing pets. And I bet the volunteers love that. That was gonna be one of my questions. Has anybody found a way to further incorporate volunteers? Because in, like in Sacramento with Nextdoor, it was 100% volunteers. And I did respond on the, um, the Maddie's board with, uh, there was a question about the sample language and the guidelines for using Nextdoor. I just put those on there. Uh, right before I hopped on this call, if anybody wants to see those. I wish That's you guys awesome. would talk out, I wish you guys would talk out loud. We could pretend like we're all together around a big table. All right, um, I'll Eric speak is, up. Oh, Chris, yay. I knew I could rely on you. <laughs> so, um, uh, you know, we were doing a lot of these things uh, before the, the challenge started, but, but I, I know during the challenge, we've, uh, We've had a conversation with one employee in particular who who is, uh, you know, uh, um, frequently using social media and comfortable in that space, and um, have solicited her help in, um, you know, in doing the the pet reunification thing via social media. So she's kind of, as we're looking to find areas of specialization among our team members, we've assigned that one individual to, to that role, and then um, developed a position description for volunteers and actively recruiting volunteers to, to join, join the team and then diversify it with you know, sub positions in there, like some folks to bring animals back out into neighborhoods. So that's a work in progress, but, um, but we, do have, we do have one individual that's, that's actively working on you know, cross-checking the um, lost animals with found animals, what we have in the shelter and what's posted on social media. That's excellent. It just takes a little bit of effort. There was a nice uh, comment in the chat about from Erica, they reunited a Yorkie yesterday that had been lost for eight months. 
and found five miles from home. Microchip. 500 was, miles. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. The lady flew to the shelter and picked the dog up and off they went. So in Tom's report too, I mean, seriously, take some time to go through it. It's, it's kind of long, um, but the data is fascinating and microchips still by far um, are the best reunification tool. Let's see. Hey, Gina, yeah, that this is, is uh, Joe Stafford and I'm in um, Des Moines, Iowa and I work for the uh, Animal Rescue League here and I run the animal services program for the city. And I just wanted to mention, um, I don't think anything, any one thing that's been shared and I've tried to make it to all the webinars has been earth shattering. But as I went and looked at our website, I really realized how disjointed our systems were and how confusing it was for citizens to try to navigate that. Um, and I think what it's done more than anything is given us motivation and opportunity to get a team together to really address that and feature the work that we're doing to keep families together, not just with returning them to home. So I really love the opportunity that this has given us and we've had you know our communications development staff directors line staff involved in this effort and i really feel like it's going to give us a great platform you know not only to keep families together but also you know as we go forward just sharing the stories that have been shared at our morning meetings about returning pets home i can see the staff you know responding to that and we've done a very good job with adoptions. We've just never featured this concept at this organization. So I, I wanted to thank you and everybody that's involved in terms of you know, giving us that opportunity. And I'm super excited to see you know, the results of this and hopefully change our culture. I mean, that's really what I'm trying to do. Well, Joe, in my opinion, that's pretty earth shattering. Hi, Potty, you guys, your team. That's great. And I think well, as I talk to people across the country, that's kind of the same sentiment that it's not just one thing, it's all the things, but the, the psychological, um, I guess, up or boost for staff when they do a successful RTO, especially like the dog missing for, you know, eight months, that feels good. And I mean, you have to admit, we don't have a whole lot of feel good sometimes. This is hard work. So good for you, Joe. What, what, who are you with again? I work uh, for the Animal Rescue League in Des Moines, Iowa, but I moved out here about two years ago from Colorado when the culture was completely different. I mean, we were entirely focused on this and I had a extremely large team out there and some of the things I see, I just take for granted. I mean, the power of, you know, a videotaped reunification where the dog is just sending out that body language and the and the you know caregiver owner of the dog is doing the exact same thing those are just things that always were near and dear to my heart but again you know just through this not realizing everybody doesn't have that experience they're focused on what goes on you know inside the shelter and trying to find pets new homes and as soon as we showed a couple of I mean you could just see staff you know, completely changed because they could immediately recognize the benefits of the work they were doing. So it's, uh, it's going to be exciting. And I, I just, again, appreciate everybody's work because I know this hasn't been easy. Good for you. Thanks for sharing that. Um, yeah, that's an awesome, Joe. Yeah, um, and I wanted to um, kind of piggyback off of that, like, and you, Joe's talking about cultural within the um, the organization, but there's some um, comments on the chat, Aaron and Emmy, um, I think I said that right, Emmy, I think that's how you pronounce your name, um, about the greater culture, right, like from the public and from our communities, and that with social media, it's really helpful, but there's owner shaming by the public, so it's a difficult platform to assist without backlash, and um, Emmy has that she's kind of had the same experience too. Um, does anyone want to talk a little bit about that? I think it's a good conversation to have out loud. Like, how do we, I mean, does, like raise your hand if you've lost your pet. I mean, I've had my cats for nearly 20 years. So, I mean, they've gotten out a time or two and it was the worst thing, right? Like it's terrible. You feel like an absolute terrible person. And many times it's through no fault of your own. It's someone else leaves the door open or, you know, you didn't realize the screen was loose or something like that. So how we can get, you know, our community with us in that culture too. 
Amber, it made me think of something that I felt when I was in Sacramento, if I felt a post was going to, there was going to be some shaming, we'd start it with bad things happen to good dogs, right? So you already set the tone that accidents happen. But I think that most people who see a negative comment like that will take care of it themselves. The shelter doesn't have to, for the most part. But I'd love to hear from anybody else on this call if you have any strategies for minimizing owner shaming. I, I don't want to monopolize, you know, but I think this is a great topic and a great time. I mean, again, because I'm relatively new in my organization, when I rolled in here, it, it was old school to me, like 20 years old. There was a lot of judgment going on and people weren't doing it because they intended to cause harm to others just simply because they honestly didn't know better and they were geared mentally, you know, for this confrontation. I mean, and in trying to you know, just using the buzzwords of the day, but really meaning them, living them with diversity, you know, inclusion and equality and really talking about meeting people, you know, where they're at. I mean, I have a very colorful past and grew up in pretty rough conditions. So I know what that's like. And I think one really effective thing that's worked for me is not trying to compare myself, but to try to recognize and empathize with people and literally walk you know, um, either physically or figuratively to the other side of the desk and then looking at the problem in terms of how we can solve it. That can be challenging from a social media perspective, but I think if we do that consistently, you know, we, we can ward off some of that, some of those energy vampires that are just keyboard warriors looking to cause problems and um, having a really good communications department helps me tremendously because they will, they will ward that stuff off very quickly. But ultimately, if you have the volunteers and staff on the same page with you, they become your defenders. So it's not your organization defending itself. It's those volunteers doing that for you, which usually shuts it down a lot quicker. But nothing makes me more angry than people judging someone else not having you know, the first clue what they're dealing with or going through. 100%, Joe, thank you. Yeah, I think, Joe, you make a really good point with the communication aspect of it. And um, I see other folks saying that um, sometimes the organization will just ignore it. And after time, people get used to like, this is what this page is for. It's not for bashing other people. It's to find lost and found. And Namiko makes a really good point that uh, changing language, like reunite instead of reclaim or redemption. It's much more, it's, it's the story of the Yorkie, right? It's those warm and fuzzies that get people um, into it. So I think, yeah, definitely changing the language can help. And it looks like Erica to you um, actually have like a disclaimer on your Facebook page. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Um, we just post, we have specific posts that we use on our Facebook page where we talk about the condition animals arrive in and what's right and what's wrong and essentially how quickly your animal can look disheveled or emaciated or that really skinny dog that needs major medical care. No, it's 15 years old and it's well taken care of and it's going through chemo. I mean, like, so, so sort of those judgment things. So we actually do lost found posts on a regular basis, um, trying to educate the public. So I just put up the last one that we did about how easily animals can be um, removed from their owners and um, it's best not to judge because it can happen to anybody. So. Oh, yeah, I'm just reading your post, Erica. That is so sad. I, I totally agree with the, the changing our language. Like, it's a happy tale when they're reunited, uh, regardless of what the owner may look like or the animal may look like. I have a dog that if she got out, I'd probably go to jail. She's so messed up, but not really. There was a, a good comment. I don't know if you want to change topics about where did it go? Um, Bridgebane Humane Society. And even though they don't oversee the ACOs but work alongside them, it looks like there's been some collaboration. Ashley, do you want to talk about that a little bit? I don't know where she is. 
anyway, she wrote that the um, ACOs have added scanners to their trucks at, at the request of the Humane Society. They're starting to implement the door hangers um, on homes where the, the animals are picked up, um, opening doors to conversation between the shelter and the ACOs. And that's exactly one of the things we really wanted to target with the entire challenge. Um, it can be done. And I think even the officers would get some joy out of driving an animal home versus putting it on the truck and driving it to the shelter, especially if they have to process them all in. So um, if, if I wanted to throw this out there, we actually just ordered our, um, finally got our fundraiser fulfilled and ordered um, 16 microchip scanners today, should be in next week. Um, our, our facility, we get 3,400 animals in a year and we only have one chip scanner for our entire facility and that includes our officers, trucks. Um, so they aren't able to check in the field, they have to bring them back. So mm -hmm. we have now ordered um, scanners for the trucks. We, the remaining 14 are going to facilities around the city um, so that they can have scanners that people can be able to find an animal after hours on the weekends and to be able to go and have those pets scanned rather than holding them until Monday and waiting for the, the vet clinic or the shelter to open up. So I think that's gonna be a huge help um, around, around the community uh, for everyone. Um, I think we're doing police stations, fire stations, the library, um, a couple of businesses like Tractor Supply, Atwoods, um, things like that. Um, and then also what was crazy this morning when I was talking to Julie at PetLink she kind of hinted towards something that I told her. I said, get in touch with Gina Nepp. This is who she is. Um, they are, and I think this is secret. So um, they are launching tomorrow a field services app. Um, so mm -hmm. I've heard. Um, and it is going to be something that um, it, it's a tool to help officers in the field um, with re reunification quickly. Um, they should be able to log into this app. Um, I think the Android um, form of it is tomorrow and, and iPhone is next or Apple is next week. Um, and I'm not really sure I'm supposed to be telling anyone, but um, it is what it is. Uh, but anyways, it's supposed to expedite the process, get them home quickly, quickly, quickly. Um, and there's also an option on there that if you find a pet and you scan it, um, being an officer, if it looks like a neglect situation, um, you can, there's an option to not immediately contact the owner to let them know that you have this pet so that you can begin your investigation and stuff, which I thought was really a nice thing. At least you know um, where it is uh, or who it belongs to and, and you can start your process there. Um, but I thought that was really cool and thought that y'all might be interested in that. And also I thought this was really neat too from, I think it was our last Huddle, or maybe the one before that, when you're talking about door tags, or maybe it was Chris talking about it, um, the door tags where your officers find an animal in the field, leave the door tag, and maybe go to a couple of doors around. Um, Shelby, our programs coordinator, has now designed a door tag for our officers to utilize. And, and um, we only have two officers for our entire city, so we may not be able to go to so many houses, but at least this is something that we can start. Um, it, it's, a good, it's a good starting place for us to be able to get those pets back home instead of intaking them into our facility. So thank you all. And it, we have taken so much out of these huddles. Um, even if we look like we're busy and working while y'all are doing this, it's it's been amazing and y'all have helped so much. So thank you. thank you. Thank you, Brandy. Yeah, the app is a, a collaboration with best friends. So I'm really excited to see what the first rollout. It's okay, it's not a secret. I mean. I'm, I'm sure not everybody knows about it, but it's you're, you didn't break any laws. So you're fine. Well, just don't tell yeah. anyone until tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> don't ask about it until tomorrow. You know, you said something, you've only have two officers, but imagine the impact. If I came home from work in this, whatever city you're in, and I have the store hanger, I'm going to tell someone about it. I'm probably going to tell a neighbor. I'm sure going to tell my husband, right? I may, I may talk about it at work. So the unintended benefits of doing that, it, we won't be able to quantify how much that is, how important that is, the, the public's perception of what officers do to try and get pets back home. I think it's going to be earth shattering. I really do. I think people are just going to be blown away by it. I hope so. And our officers, um, 
we have evolved with our officers over the last 14 years that I've been with this facility. Um, and we have gone from, you know, not so friendly, kind, um, rough mm -hmm. individuals to we have we have two ladies that are amazing. And one of them is just the kindest people you could ever meet in your life. And she really talks to you on a level that you feel like a human. And so, um, so I think that's helpful too. Um, and then also I wanted to, there was something else that I wanted to mention um, that I got for, oh, next door. So we have now been contacted by Nick. Well, we've been in touch with them and they've reached out and our city is getting um, listed on next door. I'm super excited. Um, and so at least even if no other department in the city has something, our animal services will be on next door. So we're really pumped about that. I don't, I don't know how long it takes, but at least we're in communications and working on that now. So that's we're getting really, somewhere finally. That's, that's really good news. God, I remember when I started talking about next door in 2017 and it was just, nobody was doing it. And now it's catching on like texting programs are so good for you. Congratulations. Right. And all of this has come from y'all. Like, I, I, I mean, I look at next door every day, but I never would have thought about the city having, having an account. So y'all, y'all kind of made this happen. So it's amazing. Thank y'all. Yeah. You might want to talk to Shelly Simmons in, uh, is it Greenville, North Carolina? Yeah. Um, Shelly in Greenville. She, she was the reason that her county got a next door account and the results have been not just great for the animals, but all the other departments had no idea what they were missing out on by not being able to utilize next door. So, and again, well, I posted some stuff in the huddle, if not in the huddle, but you know, what's it called? The Maddie's the forum. <laughs> the place, Maddie's the place, that forum. <laughs> the place where we talk to each other if you need some examples. It was a little daunting though, when they sent back the email stating that, hey, we don't do individual user, you know, whatever for just your department, your, your, I, I, I can't remember, communications officer or something like that mm -hmm. has to be the one to set it up. So of course, yeah. you know, we got a little pushback on that because, you know, that's the way it is. But, um, but if you read farther, it's like, oh, well, if that doesn't work and you need your own account, eh, you know, minimum subscription is 5,000 a year. And so you're kind of like, oh, wow, that's crazy expensive. Um, so we're really, like I said, pushing, um, kind of going around the communications officer to the mayor and getting this done. But, um, but I can see where it, you know, if you don't have the right people doing this, then it's, it's not going to get finished. So, yeah. um, so you really have to push, dig your heels you and do it. That's right. Sink your teeth in, no pun intended. Let's see. Yeah. Amber, there's so much chat. There's so much good stuff going on. This is amazing. Um, I did want to, we had talked to, um, to Ashley, Ashley White, because there's a couple Ashley's popular name on this call. Um, and she said something too that Brandy just mentioned that um, she has an old computer, so she can't type. So I'll speak for Ashley White right now, that they really stressed that they wanted the ACOs to be billed as helpers and not just dog catchers. And that opened up the conversation. Um, another thing from Ashley W2 is that they have um, software so the ACOs can check any information like microchips to see if there's a match before the dog even comes into the shelter. And then um, Sharon let us know that Shelter Love has a field services app too. So that's another uh, software that has that ability. So lots of good chatter. Um, yeah, oh yeah, go ahead. Into my, something just popped into my head. Most everybody has a cell phone. And you should encourage, especially if you have your own Facebook accounts that you manage, because most of us do, encourage the officers to do a selfie with the animal they found or, you know, returning it home and really blast that out on your social media platforms. A, it'll make the officer feel great. But again, it's also advertising to your community uh, about the great work that you're doing. And who doesn't want to be on Facebook, right? Um, there is a question, there's some chatter too about next door. Um, so Gina, um, and there's a few folks who weren't able to get next door accounts. Um, is there a specific person that you knew Gina at next door to reach out to? Someone was thinking they remembered that from a previous webinar. Yeah, I do have his name. They are, because Michelson Found Animals Foundation has been uh, attempting to um, convince them to let the animals space in and they just, they're not interested. They, they don't care. 
because it's not a money maker. I hate to say it, but it's, you know, we live in a capitalist society. I will put his name in the chat. What I really wish is that every animal shelter in the country and all the big wigs, um, big wigs meaning the, the national orgs could write to this guy and blow up his inbox. His name is Dan Parham. Sharon, if you sent me a message just to me, I'm trying to find it, but resend it because I can't see it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> well, in the meantime, too, I, I believe, Dan, did you have your hand up? Was there something you wanted to say? If you want to unmute, um, go ahead. Can you hear me today? Yes, loud awesome. and clear. Hi, Dan. Hi. So, we get a lot of dogs that are found in industrial areas, like where there are no houses anywhere near. What are our best steps to take other than blasting social media? Um, it, a lot of them are not microchips. What else can we do? Well, I'm presuming that it's those commercial businesses that are calling. Um, yes. Often they, a lot of them have um, video surveillance and I know it sounds crazy, but if that animal was intentionally left there by someone, then you know you're gonna have to take a different track uh, yeah. with that animal. So usually the businesses that, that I experienced anyways, where we asked for that kind of help, they were on it. People love animals. So, but those, that's a tough question. We don't know what to do. And so I would could still continue to post on social. Glenda just raised her hand. Where are you, Glenda? I see you. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I just wanted to bring a different um, twist on uh, uh, no place to like home for a tribal nation. So we are, as far as the Navajo Nation, have been under lockdown for, for over nine months. So our project was to obtain um, a proclamation from our president. So he has signed that yesterday. So we are very excited. So we continue to grow our um, partnerships and try to promote um, the best place for pets is at home. And um, we're moving forward with that information. I've, we've also partnered with our animal control program with the tribal government and our veterinary clinics and our puppy adoption program, which is a tribal program. So we've also linked with um, various animal organizations that provide services on our tribal reservation and our clustered housing sites. So we're trying to communicate with um, tenants and individuals out that live in clustered areas. So that's the Indian Health Services government quarters. We're looking at the schools. We're looking at uh, Navajo Housing Authority. So because our tribe is still under um, somewhat of a lockdown, we, we are not allowed any face-to-face -face gatherings. We are also not allowed any face-to-face um, services. So a majority of our work is going to be by website, by communication. We've got our proclamation, which is going to go into our tribal paper. We've also done bilingual radio messaging. And so we're, we're trying to do our best within the circumstances that we're in. And just a little bit of information, our tribal nation is about the size of West Virginia and our animal control program, we only have six officers. So they have their work cut out for them. So 27,000 square miles, we're trying to reach our people and trying to help them keep their pets at home and um, begin a microchip campaign. Thanks. Linda, thank you for sharing that. That is a huge territory, wow. I hope that you guys open up soon and, and, and you can continue doing the great work that you've done. You know, Sharon, who's also a brilliant Maddie's lady, posted something that I, I think is important to read. If you can't get next door, not all of us can, you can utilize your volunteers and still saturate your market. Volunteers live in a variety of places. They can post the, next, the animal photos 
um, from Pet Harbor, what have you, on their personal pages. And you're still reaching the community, just in, taking a different path. So I still think it's a, a valuable platform, even if you can't get your own account. It's very difficult, um, unless you want to pay for it, if you're uh, not a government entity. I want to say what Kim's doing. So they started by running a series of five articles in the newspaper um, over the last four weeks related to lost and found, changing perception, microchipping, et cetera, um, resulting in calls from owners about chip checking and reporting animals. And we're now able to upload lost and found to the website. They're having two free microchip clinics next month and they've integrated with Finding Rover going live on Facebook, infomercials, the list goes on. Wow, that is a lot, Kim. Congratulations. I'm glad to see um, you signed up for Finding Rover. Did everybody on this call become a Finding Rover partner? I highly recommend it if you wanna ever get a PECO grant again. <laughs> and it's, it's a no brainer. The most important thing about it though is being able to explain to people how it works and why it's important. And that means your staff and volunteers need to understand it. And I think we talked about this on one of the earlier calls, but it's so easy. Like, I don't, I know, I, I just, I don't like computers. I'm not into it. And it's so, it's so easy. Like most people can do it um, very easily. Oh yeah, and Adoptimize. Has anyone taken advantage of their free year of Adoptimize and gotten that going? Either for adoption or for uh, return to home. Yeah, that's another program that works really well. Chris, I saw you nodding. Are you full on Adoptimize already? Um, we just we just started using it in the last uh, week, to, week to two weeks. So okay. I, I'm same person that I mentioned earlier, who's helping with social media, is working on Adoptimize. Excellent. Oh, great! Actually, it looks like some folks are loving it too. Sorry, Gina, yeah. go ahead. No, no, that is great. Um, and, it, and it can have its momentary weirdness in the beginning. It's just a matter of employees getting used to using the, the, the photography system. But once you get it up and running, it really does work. Um, and there is science and data behind that too. Ashley White shared that something they did to help motivate employees to really pay attention to the lost and found site and the lost and found board um, where people, the public's allowed to post and match missing pets to owners is give them a gift card to the employee that matches a lost pet. Wow, that's really cool. And even if she, she says with an extremely limited budget, so it's not a lot, it's just a little gift card to a coffee shop or Amazon, but wow, what a fun way to incentivize. And I, I bet the employees are all over it. That's really cool. Purchased by the board members out of their own pockets. Wow. So if you've got a 501c3 attached to your government shelter, ask them to do something like this. I mean, you know, a $5 gift card is nothing when you think about it, the scheme of things, getting that animal back home is pretty priceless. And I know too, if you can't do like a monetary reward too, is there a way that somebody can get, uh, you know, an extra day off or like a hour longer lunch break or something mm -hmm. that doesn't cost any money? Oh, and actually this was a comment that was made a while back. Somebody, which I thought was really cool. Somebody was featuring their ACOs on their shelters podcast. Um, and that would be cool too. I, I would love that. Like, oh, look, here's Amber who reunited this pets and she's going to be featured on the podcast, right? Like that would be really cool too and puts a human face on it. So I think that's another really great reward and a way to humanize ACOs if we're thinking of them as still dog catchers, right? To change that perception. There was a, a, a statement that several other people kind of chimed in in the, in the affirmative. Is anyone dealing with um, scams targeted at lost dogs or lost dog owners rather. T Erica, talk to me about that. I, I am pretty it's, fortunate that I never had that problem. It's pretty bad. Um, and some of the owners have actually posted screenshots of the scams of people saying, I have your dog, um, having pictures of something that might look similar to their dog, demanding money, demanding codes through their phone, all sorts of stuff. Um, but oh. some people get way more harassed than others. It appears, but not always, um, to say that. And there, and these people are nasty when the people, do, when the pet owners don't come through with the money or the code or whatever they want from them. Um, and 
I mean, it's an emotional nightmare for some of these owners. Oh. Uh, the last one they posted, um, the woman actually did end up finding her dog and um, the, uh, the people that found it actually legit had it and demanded that she um, pay the reward before they turned the dog over. Um, and they had had it for three weeks and never reported it to anybody. So what they were willing to do with the dog, we have no idea, but I will say the biggest issue that we run into is either people refusing to get an animal scan that they find or refusing to report it at all. Mm -hmm. That's awful. And it is, you know, animals are property. So uh, when someone is being scammed like that, they should file a police report and we should be encouraging them to do that because it's, you know, it's. Yeah, it's just that you don't have a person on the other end that's scamming you. So you can create a police report all day long, but the police are going to be like, well, who's doing it? Well, it's just these numbers that are texting me. And I've got 15 different numbers that have texted me saying that they have my dog. So. Well, I mean, I, I still think it's val it's valuable to file an incident report um, so that it's on record because it happens enough times the police are going to look into it. I spent 20 years with the police department. It takes a squeaky wheel, but it can be done. There was a totally shifting gears, a comment about um, finding Rover um, in an integration with Shelter Buddy and the modification on the receipts without the knowledge of the shelter, um, Evie Toma tried to adopt the system a few years ago and was blindsided and it made, a, made them reluctant to, to work with them again. I would highly give the Petco Foundation um, an opportunity to correct that. They, they purchased Finding Rover. Um, everything is really on the up and up. And not that it wasn't on the up and up before, but it's, I, I think, a much smoother uh, program to use now without any concern about information you don't want getting out um, being released. I didn't know Lady Gaga lost her dog. Where, where have I been? No, Lady Gaga's <laughs> dog walker was out walking three of her dogs, got shot by somebody who stole two of them, and the third one ran off and the police found it. Oh, they did? Oh, I didn't know that. The, oh, the police awful. found one of the three, but her dog walker got shot and he's going to be okay. He's in the, he was oh, in the hospital. Oh, he's going to be right? okay. Good. Wow. I, I wow. must be reading the wrong kind of news. How did I miss that? <laughs> I got my news from uh, my so uh, colleague this morning, so I recommend the Irene Chansawong News Channel for all your Lady Gaga information. Wow. I Darlene, bet you, you can guess which breed they are. I have no idea. Frenchies. Oh, of course. Of course. They're so popular. Darlene put something in the chat that I love seeing. They started a pet ID tag campaign this week to provide free tags to anyone that needs them. And we're calling it Love Them, Tag Them. Soft launch on Tuesday. And they've already had 88 applications for 160 pets. That is super sweet and better. Volunteers printing up the tags every Sunday and preparing them to mail out. What a great investment huge return on investment, small cost up front, big, big savings on the end. Good for you. I am proud to say that I convinced my little local animal shelter here in Emmett, Idaho to purchase the tag machine and it will be here the week of March 15th. That's there amazing. are the challenge too. It, it's kind of fun to see because I'm, you know, it's rural where I am and they had no idea. They didn't know what RTO was or they weren't posting strays and now my phone's bleeping all the time because they're taking pictures of all the strays and sending them to me and it's pretty cool. And Darlene, that's such a great idea for those of us who are still in lockdown situations, right? It's, you can have the person email in the information and then the volunteers mail out the tag. It's very minimal contact to get mm -hmm. those in the folk, in the hands of folks who needs them. Um, do you know, we do have about five minutes left. Can you believe this went so no. quickly? I know. I was like, oh, is everyone going to talk? And it's just been such an amazing conversation. Um, so, oh, uh, real, this is a quick one for you, Gina. What uh, tag machine did you purchase for your, or did the shelter I, purchase? I have no affiliation with the company. I just bought iMark because that's what I was used to in Sacramento. It's a workhorse. It's easily uh, transportable so you can go out into the community um, you have to have electricity, otherwise, you know, get a generator, but there aren't any because the Texans bought them all. But, um, but over time, it does pay for itself and ours never broke. I mean, we had three of them and they work forever and ever and ever. And anybody could, like a volunteer could sit there for hours and do tags. So it doesn't take away from staff time. 
we had volunteers at the San Francisco SPCA that particularly loved to do that. It's a, you know, it's really easy mechanical thing to do. Yeah. Oh, and Erica has three eye marks and has had one for 10 years. So they are, yeah. they can definitely last. They last forever. Kind of like the home again scanners, they never die. They're great. Don't tell my boss I said that, but someone asked about Pet Hub. Um, is that the tags? Yeah, Pet Hub, right? Namiko, you're talking about the tags, right? I think yes, that's what she's talking about. I've been a big advocate of Pet Hub since we, we started using them in Sacramento. They're the, um, they can just be ID tags or they can be licenses and they're, um, they're pretty. Uh, they have a barcode on one side so you can open your camera if you find an animal, scan the barcode and you'll get whatever information the owner released to you. It's branded so your logo can be on it. They're not the clanky metal tags that we're all used to. My dog, um, Cole, who's probably laying behind me, yes he is, um, has been wearing his tag for at least, I wanna say three, four years. And it still looks as good as it did when we, when we put it on him. And um, they're just as cheap or just as expensive as what you're currently paying now. So Pet Hub, you send them your, your invoice for what you spent on tags the previous year or licenses rather, and they'll, and they'll meet that, um, the pricing. So highly recommend. Um, there is a question from Ann uh, Brownell about finding Rover. Um, Gina, maybe we wanna touch on this for one of our last um, subjects. Uh, that folks can't opt out of it. So um, the board and the IT members on the board are reluctant to implement it. Is that something, again, to follow up with uh, Finding Rover and PetPoint? and the, the pet owner can't opt out? I think so. And if you want to unmute yourself and um, let us know a little bit more about this question before we leave today, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. hi, Anne. Okay. <laughs> I'm a little uh, trying to do it on my phone. Well, I signed up for Finding Rover and we had to do some, forgive me, I'm not an IT person, do something with Pet Point for them to connect um, our pets to Finding Rover. And um, one of our board members is an IT big IT guy for our college here and he just was in a panic about it and then everybody um, on the IT committee got all in an uproar because of um, finding Rover getting the information and in, from people and they didn't know how it was going to be used and then finally I just said well just forget it why that's why I asked Maddie's fund if it was required but um, maybe I'll just have to have them talk to Petco. And when was this? This is quite a while ago, right? No, this was this week. Really? Yep. Yep. Huh. Yeah. I, I had can... signed up in September, not realizing what I was doing. <laughs> and then um, I signed up again and I had to have this IT person okay pet point because I'm not an admin. I'm just lower in the pet point and anyway he was just they're really um i'm i i don't know i'm just i'm not like that i'm not worried about it but they were extremely worried about it and um if people could opt out of not getting the in getting contacted or or something i hope i'm explaining it right yeah, yeah. It, it, no and i think it's a valid concern for it folks right and it's oh definitely gosh, something that they're aware of so um sharon shared that chelsea staley is on the maddie's pet forum um and she could uh hopefully help with that and then ben swan sh shared that um organizations can opt out of um something with the finding rover so i think that's a good conversation to continue in the forum especially if we have the folks from those companies there that can help answer those questions oh sorry okay. uh, chelsea is with petco so it's chelsea staley and you can see her name in the okay, chat let me see if i can shelters have total control of what information is being fed to finding rover and it's not an integration with your it you are pushing the information 
to Finding Rover. It's not talking to your platform. So it's not an integration. Uh, IT people do tend to lose their minds over this, but I really would recommend that you speak with Chelsea Staley at PECO Foundation. And I know the entire Finding Rover team there. So Anne, if you need help facilitating okay. that, let me know. Yeah, I'm going to have to need help because I'm not able to re reiterate what they're trying to say to me. The, the IT people, all I know is I'm, i I just thought it was fun. I mean, if Petco and Maddie's Fund and all these places are are utilizing it, I think it's safe is what I'm trying to say to them, but 100%. I'm just not getting it. I'm not getting it through their head. Hi, <laughs> and this is Lisa Jenkins from County of Santa Clara. Our IT is very, very tight too, and they had concerns up front, but I put uh -huh. my IT in direct contact with the folks at Finding Rover, and they were able to make modifications that satisfied our IT, and um, we're up and running now. So uh, I would, instead of trying to be in the middle and not knowing, I would definitely encourage you to just put those two in touch with each other. Well, our IT guy did contact Finding Rover, then he got all really corked up. Um, so. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> and, um, I got these big, long lecture emails and it's like, oh my God, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm <laughs> so hey, I Anne, think, what yeah. Organization, what organization are you with, Anne? You pause Upper Peninsula Animal Welfare Shelter. Say the first word again. Upper Peninsula Animal Welfare Shelter. We're other, otherwise we're known as you pause. Got it, okay. And Gina, I can, um, and I have your email from um, your previous grants and your previous stuff. So if you don't mind, I can send it over to Gina um, and you guys can, yeah, continue it if that's cool. So we are- That would be great. Yeah, well, those, it just flew by. Um, again, I would <laughs> encourage everybody to continue the specific questions. Um, and I'm so sorry for those that who raised their hand or who had amazing comments in the chat and we didn't get to you. I know, Glenda, you had your hand raised one more time. I'm so sorry we didn't get to you. But definitely encourage everyone to please join us on Maddie's Pet Forum at maddiespetforum.org so we continue this conversation. I'm going to drop um, the link to our community conversations um, in the chat too. So so folks can join us on that. Gina, do you have anything you want to add? I'm going to miss the chats, but I can't, wait to see, I can't wait to see what the grants turn out to be and what, what everybody has done. And when we start giving all the money away, it's going to be so much fun. I think that's going to be most of our favorite parts, right? Definitely. Thank you so much, Gina, for joining us on all eight of these huddles. It was amazing. We couldn't have done it without you. And Everyone on the call, we couldn't have done it without you either. So thank you so much for all you do every day for your communities, for the pets and the people. Please stay safe, everyone, so we can see you in real life and have hugs and have celebrations and continue these great conversations. Take good care. Thanks, thank you. Bye. Bye.